So, um, what's your favorite episode to work upon? Well, the old, uh, that, that's uh, a tough question because there, there were lots of episodes that were good for different reasons, you know, that were rewarding for different reasons. Um, as I've said before, Orphans was particularly gratifying because of the opportunity to work with Linda. Uh, you know, very was her episode. Uh, had some very big production that show. Almost every show had its own. You actually have to set up one shot, then leave it and go on to the next. Because I'd have to be there to shoot whatever we're going to shoot, so they wouldn't be set up a shot. And if we're really scrambling for time, while they start to light that, I might take the actors and the cinematographer show them what what our needs are there, so pre-lighting done on that set as well. So they may be lighting several sets at the same time, but rarely would they would I be shooting on one set. While being at another one. While being at another one. I, it would be impossible for me, unless it was for some reason something that I could turn over to an AD to shoot, but I, I frankly have never done that. It's such a whirlwind of activity, it's yeah. unbelievable. You're orchestrating how many different you could call it discipline at the same time. Yeah, that's what's exciting about it. I mean, there's almost, a, yeah, almost anything you learn anywhere else you will sometime use as a director. You know, it's, it's very exciting. There's a musical flow to it. When it really yeah, there really is. It becomes a kind of a dance. There are times when you're working with all the equipment, you know, the cranes out, all the cameras are out, you've got several, you know, several camera crews shooting at the same time, you've got extras moving, a lot of action happening, and you've got performance going on and you know what you want in your head and you put all the information out there to the various departments and then it's a question as to whether or not it flows and it's mm. very much like a dance sometimes and you get the kind of thrill from the director's point of view you get the kind of high from seeing it come together mm. and have it function happen yeah. the way you envision. very often you know what you know what the intention is you know how it's going to look when you when it act when the camera's actually rolling and everybody's doing their thing and everybody else might not quite know what the overall mm. thing is. Each person knows their own role in it. And there's a certain kind of tension where everybody feels, well, this will this work? I don't know if this will work. They don't know quite what it is that is they're expecting. Is there expected experimentation, really? No, no, that isn't so much experimentation as just never, s there's certain things, certain times when you don't, you don't actually get to see it until it's, until you're actually rolling. Mm. You get to rehearse certain elements. For example, stunt work. Um, or somebody this afternoon mentioned that they had been on the set when we had, when we blew up a car. Or, um, I can't remember which show it was now. I think it was the movie. Oh, yeah. It was the Love the Love, love, love okay. Yeah, that's right, because it was the opening of the season. <laughs> and, well, you can only do that for camera, you know. If you have to do it a second time, it's pretty tough. So you Did you have more than one camera for that shot? Or we just had, one? Uh, I think I had four cameras on that one. Just to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Not only to make sure, but because I needed those pieces of film to cut together in the final, final scene. I wanted those various angles, different speeds, different mm -hmm. lenses. Um, and we weren't going to be able to shoot it four times each for a different setup. So it wasn't so much for protection as for actually needing those angles. I noticed that the stuntman Zach actually did smoke. Uh, oh, it was very... <laughs> was that planned? Well, that was planned, you know, that, that was, planned? yeah, that was... Nice effect. Yeah, <laughs> no, that was already, um, that was, he was rigged for that. But it was uh, a, a remarkable effect. It was very, very beautifully executed by everybody. But as I say, nobody knew, mm. we all knew what, everybody knew their job, but nobody knew what would it look like standing back, watching it take place when it actually took place. Do you take it all the way into the editing room? Sure, yeah, I do. And, uh, 
at some point I have to let go of it. I usually work on the cut as, as far into it as I can, uh, usually get it to where I'm happy with it, and then you know, I have to turn it over and then people start to play with it. They're usually not... They're usually Was there ever a compromise that you wish you hadn't had there, to There are compromises from time to time. Yeah. Uh, generally on Beauty and the Beast, fewer compromises than I have had in most other situations, in, in many other situations. I've, I've had a couple of situations where one or two situations where the compromises really have been terrible. I mean, after I've turned it over, I've then looked at the final. I've done so many episodes that... Um, in Beauty and the Beast, uh, really each episode kind of dictated a little bit the kind of approach I would take. But, of course, the show has already established a certain look. And it was a question of trying to fulfill that on a continual basis every week. Um, and in terms of style, it's just really the way the way I like to hang on a face, you know, the, you know, the way I like to stay with the moment. It's timing more than almost anything else that would have been my stamp there. Which is also dance-like. Yeah, that's... that's or rhythm, rhythm more. Yeah, exactly. Um, but within te series television, there's ju there is just so much you can you can bring to it other than what you're like on the set in terms of giving everybody the right kind of support and information they need to, to get the job done. To what extent do you visualize when you first see a script? Oh, tremendous. Do you hold, yeah. it, do you hold the entire thing in your head and, and block it out and shoot? Yeah, I, I have worked over the years various ways where I, 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 I develop in my head exactly what I want to do. Yeah, and unless it's, a, it's an extremely rudimentary scene, um, I will get fairly specific in my head before I go to the set uh, as to what I want, what kind of, what kind of camera treatment I want to apply to that scene throughout. So I know on every line, where do I expect, in the final cut, where do I expect to be? Mm. And so I, uh, when I go onto the set, I will, I will shoot those shots that will serve that. But um, over the years, I've worked either by annotating that for myself before I go onto the set, or in some instances, just walk, walking on the set and doing it. In the last few years, I have created shot lists for myself, so I walk on the set. I, but mainly it's because it's a wonderful reference for everybody. Else, mm -hmm. Now, the most copious notes, or yeah, it's basically a list of all of the shots for each scene that I intend to shoot on that day, with this, this descriptive, uh, you know, kind of notation as possible, so people can understand so what's you're in my responsible head. responsible for the planning of a day. To serve oh yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, I think we're running out of tape. Okay. This has been yeah. really fascinating. Thank okay. you very much. You're quite welcome. Oh, so. <laughs> well, that's the sewage. <laughs> See the oh, Arco station I told you about right here? The Arco station, they uh, built the hotel around it. About 2 o'clock in the morning, they released the sewage into the sewage holding tanks, as we're now experiencing as we go by the beautiful Excalibur Hotel. <laughs> you know what's funny, Steph? This whole shot goes straight in the Takes me in and makes me feel that I am safe. 
to Vincent's world. That's when I go down to a place that no one knows, a secret place, a world away, a special world, the world of Vincent. He takes me in and makes me feel. and writer of two scenes called Beauty and the Yeast and The Absurd Season. And The Absurd Season has just come out. Yes. And is available. Okay. Uh, what, um, how did you get started as an artist? As an artist? Uh, well, I got started by being born. <laughs> well, let's move it ahead. Life. Life. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I guess I got started somewhere around the age of five. Uh, I've just done it all my life. And uh, did you? Were you always into co comics, comic type? Ah, uh, well, not really. Um, uh, it's something I'd like to do more with. Uh, I'd especially like to try doing a serious graphic novel oh. based on Beauty and, and the Beast, and not just not just parodies, although more parodies, I suppose, will be forthcoming. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, did, was there an inspiration for Beauty and the Beast? Ah. Uh, I don't remember what it was. Uh, oh yes, yes, there was. It, it was that. It was that beautiful painting of, of uh, Vincent with his arm around Catherine here. Uh, the one done by Olivia that's uh -huh. on the cover of the Wendy Peeney, um, uh, uh, the first graphic novel that she did. Um, I, saw, I looked at that painting the first time and I thought, oh, just just drop his hand a little more. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and it just went from there. Basically, it just built on that and it just took off. And I, I decided that my title should have something in it that rhymed with beast, and the yeast came to mind, and so I built the story around that. So it's still, Beauty and the Yeast is still selling well, too, eh? Yeah, it's doing all right. Huh? I think uh, there seems to be a lot of, um, a lot of appreciation of humor in, in fandom in general. Well, that's a healthy sign. Well, so it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, will the next scene that you do be comedy, comedic or do you think you will go into that so serious one at the next project? Well, right now I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm soliciting uh, ideas and uh, hopefully finished scripts or stories that people feel might adapt well to um, a graphic novel presentation. Mm -hmm. um, however, I also have a, a, another idea for another parody, which will be somewhat different from the first two, but will still be a, d a parody of, you know, especially dealing with Catherine's apartment, which I haven't done much with. Hmm. And I'm itching to do something with her apartment, so uh -huh. that will be a, a, a large focus of the next story. In particular. Particulars. Okay, Keepers of the Rose was founded a little over a year ago by moi, because um, when I called Kimberly Hartman of Helpers Network, she told me there was no Orange County chapter for a fan club. So she gave me a couple of names of people to call, one of whom was Lynn, to organize a group. and. Um, Everybody was busy or had, all, you know, things, so I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and it just kind of snowballed after that. <laughs> I got a list of names from advocates and took the Orange County people off and wrote to them. And uh, it just kept going, and now we have about 42 members uh, through International. Um, our club, we try to meet on a regular basis, but it's really hard to meet everybody's schedule because we're spread all throughout Orange County and L.A. and Whittier and Long Beach and San Diego, and so we're spread all around. Um, we try to do things. Our club is real oriented in trying to help the community. Last year, we sponsored two homeless families for Christmas. We actually took gifts and food over to them and shared a little bit of, of Christmas with them. And it was really the one family that we went to over in Santa Ana. It was great. Um, it was a mother, a father, their two children, and her sister and her mother. And the baby, um, who wasn't there, he was at the hospital, has cancer. 
and um, also he's Down syndrome. So, I mean, it's been a real tough time for them, and they were just so thankful for any little thing that we did. We, we got them a refrigerator because they needed one for the baby's formula, and our girlfriend of mine donated one for them, and um, we took it over there and hauled it up two flights of stairs. <laughs> he hauled it up two flights of stairs. <laughs> yes, and it was just, it was a great, really neat experience. Um, we're just as a group, we're just kind of dedicated to keeping Beauty and the Beast alive as much as possible and in doing things, you know, in the spirit of Beauty and the Beast. Um, the, our next meeting we're going to talk about, you know, hopefully everybody will be wanting to sponsor another, you know, couple families this holiday season. And I have to get going on my project, which is to take a story hour to children's hospitals and um, homes and things like that, you know, for kids that are like bedridden and can't get out. And hopefully to see their citizen home too, the same sort of thing. That maybe we can take and, you know, bring things into them so when they're stuck in these places and they can't get out. It's just trying to get everybody's schedules together to work it out, basically. Do you also do a newsletter? Yes, I do a newsletter called Rose Petals, which I'm always sorely behind on. You know what that's like. <laughs> Since I, again, it's a one-woman operation, so I'm like trying to get everything together and I'm begging my members begging my members for any input they can give me. And um, then I have to put it together. My next one should be coming out probably in the middle of September. The last one was really it was a good one. Don't expect that this year, this time, you guys. It won't be that good this time. But um, What are the dues? The dues are $10 yearly, and that includes your glorious membership button here, artwork by moi, um, membership cards um, that have the club logo and description of the club and actual honorary member type cards and then the newsletter which is quarterly which is ends up more being long quarters but um, we try to get it out and it has poems and artwork and stories and various different things in it. It's not really a newsletter in fact of like telling what's going on it's more of like you know members sharing things with other members. Mm -hmm. We try. <laughs> we're, we're small but we get big hearts. That's what matters. We got a good, good bunch of people. We do a lot of oh. real caring people and they got a lot of good hearts. Thank good you very much. much. I'm proud of them. You are noticing fuzzy little people. I usually start these things by, by saying the same thing. Um, the show was given a second chance, and the reason the show was given a second chance was because of your, your cards and letters and phone calls and, and bothering the hell out of CBS. I, I want you to know I appreciate it. I got my job back. <laughs> I don't have one anymore, but that's okay. And uh, thank you. All right, the question is, where is Vincent's Rose, Jay? <laughs> and what the hell were those rings all about? I still want to know what those rings are. Just one, actually. Particularly <laughs> funny story about the Well, good luck. <laughs> no. In the third season, was Joe, Joe going to meet Vincent? Yeah. And unfortunately, there was a rule in Beauty and the Beast: you meet Vincent, you die. Times so, <laughs> during scenes that were strictly Linda Hamilton and you, or Linda's scenes, we would notice a fuzzy figure in the background that we know was Ron Perlman. Did, did you have him in the background in some of the shows? We did. You were noticing fuzzy little people. In the background. Was it Ron back there? If you thought it was. Yeah. <laughs> the rose and the flame and the first time I love I'll, I'll answer that question. Very happily answer that question. That's, that sequence is truly one of, oh, what the heck? It's, it's one of the real embarrassments for me. <laughs> and uh, that, se that sequence took me by surprise when I saw the finished. I didn't know that it existed. I had fought 
like crazy to shoot something properly during, during production of that, that show. And even during my, my uh, period in post-production, I fought like crazy to work with special effects and some of the footage that we had to construct that sequence. And as things very often happen in series television, the director has to step aside and let the powers that be take over. And I didn't see that sequence uh, with its music track at all <laughs> until we were all invited to the final screening. And I was as disturbed by it as you were. I was embarrassed by it. And, and, but, uh, And here I was all this time trying to protect them on this. <laughs> Every time I've been asked that question, I said, well, it's not really, you know, it's not Victor's fault. It just it, it happened that way. And God, I did everything to get around that question. <laughs> How you doing? Know? Right. Good question. Oh, and I had a question about that too. Did you in fact film a scene inside the cave that, that we didn't see? I don't know, I wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. There was an ongoing battle about that. We actually, there were several camps. <laughs> we wanted to shoot, some of us wanted to shoot, uh, not terribly graphic footage, but we wanted to shoot something that we saw two people coming together. Uh, you know, yeah. And the, the, uh, the general consensus at that time was we would shoot that footage and then we would play with it post-production visually in such a way as to make it palatable for everybody. Um, the battle went on all the way through production and we never even got to shoot footage that I was happy with. Then all I had, what was shot was virtually the pieces that you saw. Uh, there were. There was some body contact. There was, uh, you, well, no, it didn't see that. there was some footage that did show some body contact that was never used, but there was very little of that as well. And um, basically, it was just all constructed out of stock footage and, and uh, music track. There was just a fear that there would be a reaction. There was always, all through the show, there was always a, a, a battleground as to whether or not anyone wanted to see this concert. It was just the argument. Yeah, but you know, the argument also was that uh, not everybody is as vocal as this group, and therefore they, the, net, the networks always look for a middle ground. Well, because if you're not dealing with it, if you're not approaching anything creatively with real intention, you end up with nothing to work with, and that's what that's what ultimately happened. We didn't have the footage. Yes. Something like 
The only relationship that matters on this show is Vincent and Catherine trash everyone else. So, and I mean, I'm not saying they said that, I'm saying that's what can happen. And then the writers have to fight us. One of the other, one of the other problems is, is it's nuts and bolts. I mean, you, you've got to get the show on the air and you have to figure out a way to do that. The network's going to work. There are certain guidelines at times. Sometimes they'll leave you completely on, on your own. But when they feel the show is in, uh, it's in trouble in terms of numbers, they're going to start to give you guidelines. Now, you can either really look at those guidelines and say, these guidelines absolutely do not work for this show. The show is going to collapse creatively if we follow these guidelines. Or you can say, as often as the case, let's see if we can somehow use these guidelines in order to get the show on the air and slowly make some kind of inroad back to where we want it to be. And that was the intention, I think, uh, all along, whenever we followed uh, network guidelines, was to find something that would set, uh, you know, satisfy the network's needs, and at the same time not take us so far off track that we could get, slowly get back on track, or, or, or at least still somehow stay connected to the core of the show. It's a very tough road to, to travel, and no one can ever do it successfully, frankly, but it's, it's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Very well put. Hi, go ahead. reaction when I first found out that Linda Hamilton was going to be leaving the show. Uh, the God's truth, when I found out this, at the end of the second year that she was going to be leaving, I thought it was a ploy to get more money. That's what I thought it was. I thought she's threatening to quit so they'll give her more money. And when I in fact found out that was not so, that she really was unhappy and wanted to get out of the show, or whatever the situation was for her, I was pretty stunned. And, and uh, and I didn't think the show would, would really work without it. That was my decision. Um, this lady wants to, uh, she knows that I'm a friend of Linda's and, and she wants to know at this point in time, would Linda come back to do a feature film? Is that the question, pretty much? I don't know. Uh, yes, I am a friend of Linda's. I, I think everyone who worked on the show whether it is. Um, we don't see her that much. I don't see her that much. Uh, the last time I saw her was about three months ago. Uh, I was down at her house. Um, and I know she's been away making films. And she's about to start Terminator 2. Uh, I don't know. I don't know uh, whether she would do it or not. No, I haven't read any of the fan fiction. Um, and wannabe screenwriters write. I mean, that's the, the toughest part. The toughest part of being a screenwriter is writing. And you learn through the writing. You write, 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 write. If you've got the talent, you'll get better, 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 better. And if you get good enough, you will sell your material and you'll have a career. But if you don't write, nothing will happen. That's really, that's really all you've got to do is write.
So it's not like they call me up and say, we want you to have a staff meeting. We're making a decision about whether or not you can get a school. So.
chain falling off the door mysteriously, and the paint not being dried, so you know that confused everybody too. <laughs> uh, but it was great fun. From what I understand, when they did the episode, a lot of people enjoyed working on it. And then the Hamilton especially liked working on it. She said, usually all she ever got to do was cry. So <laughs> she got to laugh this time. Closer? I am sorry. <laughs> Well, the cafe sequence, and I mentioned this this morning too. Uh, the artwork that was used for the episode, it wasn't my cup of tea, and evidently it wasn't Linda Hamilton's cup of tea either, because she told me exactly what she thought of that painting hanging on the wall of the mermaid. Um, there was a line that had to be dumped out of the script where at the table, Christopher said something about the head dragon kicking and screaming into the 20th century, but obviously the artwork was very 20th century, it was the old world like it was supposed to be. Also, at the end of the episode, that wonderful voiceover where Frank reads the Oscar Wilde quote, during production, they were going to skip that. And Frank went in to do some looping and said, well, what about the voiceover at the end? And he said, forget it. We're just going to skip it. Frank said no. So he did that in one reading, one whole reading, and just sort of like wrapped everything up. And just <coughs> The question was, uh, uh, which was my favorite character? Uh, Pascal is, is definitely my favorite because at times, the writers uh, gave me some stuff to do. Not, it didn't always end up in the final product, but I got to at least put it on camera. Uh, some really wonderful, wonderful scenes. The writers were terrific, and uh, I was working with good actors and great directors. But to answer your question, uh, my favorite other role on TV would probably be uh, the safe man in L.A. Love. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, yeah, she, asked, she asked if I needed any special training for the, uh, the crossbow that they needed to use. Um, Bill Dietz, the prop master, he had to be the same, said, okay, this is how you work it. Go <laughs> practice so you don't knock out any of our camera people. <laughs> paper plate about 40 feet away from me and said, try to hit that. <laughs> so that's what I did. That was it. And I, I tell you a funny moment. OK, we're shooting this scene right now. She's going to save my life. Yeah. Uh, and she's got this crossbow. I've been watching this crossbow, you know. <laughs> and she's been practicing. She's pretty good with it, you know? So we get to the scene where um, she goes to shoot it, and I, and I see it. And on the tape, it looks great. It just goes Phew! right out of the thing. Unfortunately, you don't see it, it just looks like that. <laughs> okay, okay, the other ones, when we're shooting not past the camera, they'd shoot it far, but then, you know, obviously, if you're going to be shooting towards another actor or towards camera people, they had me, they, they put, instead of a, a, a taut steel thing to, to propel the, the arrow, they gave me a, a rubber band. <laughs> <laughs> a rubber band bag, and go, <laughs> genuine friends on and off the set. It, it so happens, as you might be aware, that you're working with other people, your co-workers, is a kind of a, a forced connection so that you've got to get to know them. Because you're together for a long time, you get to know things about each other's personal life and your taste and things you have in common. So it's a natural occurrence. You're talking about teasing and teasing each other, teasing on the set. I'm going to reveal something about a, a man not present, but I mean Ron Perlman. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, uh, it was the last day I worked with him, or one of the very last days I worked with him toward, toward the end of the episode shot. And I had noticed at all times in the beginning that I had ever worked with him that he was the biggest hitter before a heavy duty shot that I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I was astonished sometimes at the kind of levity he showed just before we would go into some extreme heavy duty situation. And the one that was most memorable that I asked him about, because I was sitting next to him as we were waiting for a, a lighting setup to do a shot that I was curious about, 
was we were doing, I believe it was called Brothers, with the character was originally called the Giant. It was changed because of the nature of the words. It was Stranger, I think. Our script wasn't it about the very large fellow that was in the carnival. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and in that last scene, when they all come out of the uh, tunnel to tell us that he's going to go to the world above and he's found a solution, and we of heavy did more time to decide what's going to happen with him. Just before we rolled that, all four of those guys, your, your incredible people, were in a king can land. <laughs> And I knew that they were doing it, which they did do a wonderful job at the end of the show. And can you imagine 30 seconds before them all together, their arms kicking up and seeing them just going away. So I asked Ron, I said, Ron, I said, I watched you. I have profound respect for your technique. I've seen you do a lot of things. I've seen you do other roles. I said, is this a, a technique of playing against the actual emotion of a scene so that if you've got a say, a very heavy duty scene coming up. So just as you're getting close to it, you go the opposite direction to kind of clear your emotional state. Is that shot up? He said, no, Rich, I like to have a lot of fun. I'm here. So you work with your females, harm them, and force them to wear clothing. Oh, this isn't your first convention, but your first band convention. Uh, right. My first, my first convention was in Atlanta, but this is my first band convention. What do you think of going to conventions? I have had a great time. The people have been terrific. Uh, there's a lot of warmth. There's a lot of confusion. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and a lot of love coming. So that's that's been terrific. So what are you doing right now? Um, waiting for my agent to call. Um, I, I'm about to do a film called uh, New Men. Uh, which I play principal school. It's about uh, two young men who who uh, invent a robot and the spirit of the dead father invades the robot. And uh, then I hope to go back to work on some episodes of Cop Rock, which is a new Steve Bochco uh, TV show. So, um, and in that I have a wig and I play a son of a bitch. So uh, it's a little different from Pascal, yeah. who doesn't have a wig or isn't a son of a bitch. Well, also different from a Ferengi. Uh, who is a son of a bitch and uh, <laughs> doesn't have any here at all. I at least have some. Ferengi have no, actually they have just a tiny bit in the back. It is almost impossible to tell which Ferengi you are. Um, how can you tell? <laughs> Ferengi can tell each other apart. Um, which one am I? In the What's the name of that is? A distant, no, the, the, the Watcher? Uh, the Watcher, I think, might be the name of the episode. And there are three Ferengi, um, and I am the science officer, lead Ferengi. I'm the one that has most of the lines. Uh, so, um... One should be able to recognize your voice. No, because my voice is, is, is garbled. Uh, m my favorite line of all time is in that Ferengi episode, which was, um, Face two. You work with your females, harm them, and force them to wear clothing. <laughs> Which was, um, that's a, that's a, a Ron Perlman ripoff, actually. <laughs> Who taught us, by the way, a great technique. Well, you probably know this. A great technique was we all learned to talk very quietly. Did you notice that, Jay? Is it that the yeah. everyone began to talk very quiet? And it gets, it's actually quite good. I've used it on other shows. It's really quite terrific. But you do have still control over that. Well, what happens is the, the sound people keep saying, uh, could you speak up a little louder? And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. And you continue to talk just like this. And then they crank their machines up. Becomes the norm after all. That's right, yeah. So uh, would you consider being in the B&B feature? Uh, I don't think you'd have to ask me twice, no. I don't think you'd have to ask me twice. Uh, I've had a great time playing this role. I met a lot of good people. Um, I got to play a character that was pretty close to who I am. Um, and that was uh, refreshing as opposed to playing Ferengi or snake people or monsters or accountants or uh, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I would, do it, I would do it in a moment. Yeah. Oh, thank you for speaking. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We are going once. Doing the bows, going twice. <laughs> and we have soul <laughs> for three hundred dollars. Um,
ring for uh, my well, Tell me again fans. about this odd sort of fame that you have with these fans. Well, in the context of Beauty and the Beast fandom, um, those of us involved with the show are sort of incredibly popular. Uh, uh, whereas in the rest of the world, we may or may not be known, depending on whether or not they've seen this show or the other things we've done. Um, I'm known for fame as well. But nonetheless, you know, some of my friends don't, eat, don't really have an idea that I come and, you know, it's like I say I need a bodyguard to come with me and they laugh. Right. <laughs> well, describe to me the, the typical Beauty and the Beast fan. The typical Beauty and the Beast fan is female. <laughs> That's not bad. No. Um, and is literate and thinking and caring and has a heart bigger than their chest cavity. Okay, so they're very concerned with the uh, things of romance and classical literature and so forth. Yes, and if they weren't when they started out watching the show, they become that way from from exposure to these things on the show, which is yeah. a very nice thing. They're also very active people. They're doers, people who organize something like this, people who make art, people who write poetry, people who have uh, their emotions about the show, led them to doing a good deal of charity work for the homeless, for AIDS projects for other forgotten people because the people that they're looking up to on the show are basically homeless rag people. The <laughs> underdog. The underdog, yeah. yeah. Um, the undercat. <laughs> you know, the show's been canceled. I heard. It, and <laughs> how did you react? Well, I, I, I sort of knew it was coming. Um, yesterday we were talking about a scene that uh, Ron Perlman and Rich Brinkley and I were shooting that it kind of had a heavy feel to it, and on that day I knew the show would be over. And of course, I know these things anyway, so that's not fair. What's the prognosis? <laughs> What's the prognosis, though? I mean, you're out of a job. Uh, I'm not, well, after you're an actor, you're out of a job every, every job you get. You know, it's, uh, actors do nothing but look for a new job. <laughs> yeah. I was looking for a new job way before this one was over. <laughs> Are you willing to come so, back if it's picked up again? Um, under certain circumstances, yeah. If it was right, if all if the right creative people were back and the right, if, if the cast was back and the creative people were back, I would be there because it's the most fun I've ever had, the best ensemble of, of writers and directors and actors I've been involved with since my training when I was a kid. Right. <laughs> and uh, I think that, what the, and I think we might maybe see a feature film of Beauty and the Beast, and that's what I would like to see happen. That's what I've been saying since the middle of our second season when we were really at the peak of our success, I was saying, let's stop doing this every week and do it once a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that's the that's the, the canvas the show could really move on. And we were making a feature film every week anyway. So I was well. stay right where you are and keep talking and he's gonna yeah, okay, do the reverse take a look at ways. Yes, reverse is some cutaways. Um Ron's personal appeal has to do with his incredible powers as an actor. Ron's the the most powerful actor I've ever worked with. Um, slight movement from his back can send chills down my spine and the tears coming out of my eyes. He made me look very good on camera. Uh, his voice, his, his, his talent. But the, the, I think what the fans react to is the character's appeal. The appeal of Vincent. David, great, great, great. I interrupt? Yeah, you know, the appeal is Vincent, but you know, once you get into this, you in, you embrace the entire concept of the show, right. and thus you embrace all the extra characters, Pascal that's, and David. And that's the, the, the beauty of it is that all of the characters are their home and the reality, their reality within the show would never have existed if it wasn't for Vincent. And Vincent is a great, a great literary hero, a great hero of literature. I kind of, I tend to equate him with bigger heroes from fact and fiction because people can ask the question, you know, over and over again I see people in fandom and and, and myself and in letters I read, people confronted with value judgment dilemmas, say what would Vincent do? And kind of like saying what would Gandhi do? Or or James Kirk. <laughs> no, because James Kirk would respond with violence perhaps. Yeah. Which Vincent, Vincent would never ever do unless it was Unless he was against the wall. What would Elvis do? Huh? What would Elvis no. do? What would Riker do? Elvis would take drugs, but what would Jesus do? <laughs> See, I try to avoid saying that, but now <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump next. 
Yeah. And, and the answer to the question, what would Vincent do, is really always the same as, you know, the right thing? What, what is the right thing to do? And to love that character is to get a real, get right in there next to that. Gordon, I'll tell you one thing too about this. You know, one question was asked of Victor Lobo, the director of yeah. many, many episodes yesterday, uh, about, you know, like Star Trek, they have, they, they drag this blooper reel for 25 years. It's I just see. almost, you can't even <laughs> see it anymore. You have no blooper reels? No, no let me explain. Victor Lobo, and I agree with what Victor said too, well, you'll never see it on this because the respect that everybody has for the show and the characters is such, we don't want to, you know, prostitute it that way. Right. There's almost no merchandising. It would not there aren't be, any pictures yeah. of Mouse, for example, are, because Mouse doesn't know about the press. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and as strange as that sounds, you know, there's usually the, the split thing between the actor and the character. That starts to vanish when you're dealing with somebody playing Vincent. You know, I did three or four episodes before I ever saw Ron's face. Yeah. And I've spent, you know, well, oh, a hundred times as much time with Vincent as, as with Ron. Morning. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're you're now, guys, oh yeah, like Stephen Sill said about Christ, he was the first time in violent revolution. Exactly, exactly. And I spent a lot of time saying Gandhi and stuff. Yeah, you know, Vincent just has the power to kick somebody. Look what happened to John Lennon when he said they were as popular yeah. as Christ, you know, yeah. so I, I try to be careful yeah, I think, say things you know, like that. A lot of times the press, they want to take it, like we're kind of frivolous, but we're real serious about a lot You were seeing the candlelight ceremony last night, the mandrigals, the poetry rings, the magic. That's where the highlight of my it weekend. It was a marvelous, oh, marvelous yeah. thing. They were gorgeous. Yes, they sounded good, too. I bought you a gift. I have one already. Relationship with a beautiful woman, but finding it on your TV dial is going to be a bit difficult for a while. Gordon Tokumatsu attended a convention of Beauty and the Beast fans who have been in Las Vegas all weekend. The show that technically doesn't exist anymore. Beauty and the Beast was the classically inspired program about a half-man, half-beast named Vincent who lived in an underground fantasy world. He sweeps a human off their feet and their adventures together made up the series. CBS canceled it after three seasons on the air. The Beast was played by Ron Perlman, who couldn't attend the meeting, an actor these fans can't find words to describe. The typical Beauty and the Beast fan. Typical. Somebody that is intelligent. The typical Beauty and the Beast fan is female and is literate and thinking and caring. And so Beauty and the Beast no longer exists on network television. But city above us raised its towers to the sky men sought shelter in these caverns in those days these tunnels were dark places we can have air conditioning down <laughs> and those who received it we are all a part of one another one family one community. Sometimes we forget this. The greatest darkness is nothing. So long as we share this light, let's share the light.
and Robin Warren. several episodes, but Happy Life and Orphans, Victor Lowell. And I'd like to present with him one of the many outstanding elements of the series, Jay Acabone. <laughs> Hello, I'm Victor Lowell. <laughs> and he's not. <laughs> Okay, well, it, uh, it, says, it says on this piece of paper that uh, we should talk for 10 or 15 minutes. <coughs> and time's ticking by. Uh, I've done about seven of these um, in, the, in the past year, year and a half. Not, not seven tone counts, naturally, but seven conventions. And most of those, I think all of those, were done through creations. This is the classiest one I've ever been on. I'm just going to pretty much second everything that Jay said. He has, uh, here he's done this a lot, you know, a lot of different instances before. I, this is the first time I've done this ever, and I had no idea what to expect. I have a suspicion that if I were ever to do this again, everything would be pale, it really a pale comparison alongside this event. This was really a lot of fun. The enthusiasm is just absolutely amazing. Everybody's having a, a wonderful time here, and uh, the sense of involvement in this whole thing, it's just, it's, it's really, it's really a lot of fun to come in and experience it. And the best thing is, Jay and I got a chance to try out our act together, which is... <laughs> in your lives, in your personal aspirations. You may all, in your darker sides, um, lusted after Vincent one time. <laughs> speech. Why not? Because I'm not that clever. <laughs> um, but I, I don't really know what to say other than um, seeing all of your people here and the, the tremendous outpouring of love and, um, and affection, true affection from you all is just uh, overwhelming and really, really nice. Uh, and thank you so much for that and for everybody who organized this incredible thing. That, you're right, this is just, the, it's the snappiest Snappiest convention I've ever been at. <laughs> Rich Brinkley, and he's, he did a wonderful job. Rich Brinkley. <laughs> I 
I think I was next. <laughs> There's a wonderful story told about Tyrone Power. He wanted to join the Beverly Hills Country Club. The president of the club came to him and said, Mr. Power, the Beverly Hills Country Club does not accept actors. To which he replied, actor, hell, I have over 200 films to prove I'm no actor. <laughs> Well, I'm no poet, and yet I have before me something I wrote. A lot of people have asked me at Winterfest, and I'm standing over by those big oaken casks, which Victor is shouting, don't lean on them, they're empty. What's really in those? What are you serving? Well, you don't want to hear the special effects guy's electric pump and Kool-Aid story. Because we're here to share the dream, right? So now I'm going to tell you what I put in those and how we did it. And I'm challenging you with this that I read to talk me in the next year through your fanzines. And the people that coordinate your fanzines have said they're very willing to help me coordinate this. This is William's Winterfest Mulz Vinum, a Leonine libation. <laughs> Prithee, if thou hast been done favors by helpers kind and true, if thy fellows above have shown thee their truest shades of blue, then lead them down to the great hall, but first bid them hide their eyes, and as fitting reward for their ardor, prepare ye this ancient surprise. <laughs> First, find five fine friends whose fondness for kinship doth exceed their stalwart virtuosity in battling both thistle and the weed. <laughs> Call them then to join thee in an oaken cask so great there be no room for avarice, jealousy, nor for hate. Take all boots, slippers, stockings, Place them with it, two by two, awaiting their redemption when vendors' tasks are through. <laughs> from nature's fruitful bounty, pluck meats from a thousand limbs, sweet Adirondack cherries, or match the berry of your whims. <laughs> then smash, dash, and stomp them, and the tarantella smit with glee, <laughs> till three score toes reach out, dancing to be free. <laughs> Next, Take a cheesecloth from the bakery. Strain the nectar till it be pit free. Mix in the honey of human kindness from the depths of a sycamore tree. Now, build a roaring bonfire of hickory, ash, and oak. Keeping the flames a leaping, whether with the bellows or the stoke. Boil away your troubles, its bubbles, and the brew till the bouquet rises smartly, smelling sweetly and so true. <laughs> Store in kegs of coopered mahogany, neath the light of a crescent moon, never to be forgotten, nor disturbed a fortnight too soon, but aged with mellow tolerance, till this day be festive and gay, then barrels rolled out with merriment and tapped by comrades at play. <laughs> Finally, with tankards raised toward heaven and arms linked soul to soul, take a moment of silence to ponder. True friendship is value. Then skull. <laughs> thought also from my favorite classical play mentioned earlier, I've done Cyrano de Bergerac six times around the country. And the last thought I'd like to leave you is from Act 5, Cyrano's death scene from Roxanne, who says simply, how many things have died and are reborn? Thank you. David Greenlee.
great time here. I've been to a few cons, and none of them have been like this at all. This has been uh, more fun, easier, and more interesting than any of them I've been to, even those that are run by slick businessmen. <laughs> I've been before. And so congratulations to those of you who helped pull this off, and thank you for bringing us all together. Gotten to see a lot of people that I don't get to see enough of, both out there and up here, people I haven't seen for ages. <laughs> and it's really been nice. And it's been particularly nice having people from around the world here at this con. And our visitors from Germany and Belgium and the United Kingdom, various places. That's very <laughs> exciting to me. And, and Rich's poem, which was wonderful, is exactly the sort of thing that that, that really moves me about the show and the reaction to it. Everybody keeps doing things, making things, and communicating, bridging gaps, some, for some reason, because of seeing the show. And that's very satisfying. It's amazing to see. When I was making Fever, I told George Martin that I didn't think anybody was going to get any of this. And I was very wrong. And I'm very glad. Thanks a lot. Special people who don't fit any category. Yeah. And the person who is going to deliver those awards is uh, Daryl and Malone. times and not in prepare things, so please forgive me. So often, um, there are a lot of unsung heroes out there. A lot of people have done a lot for Beauty and the Beast. Uh, a lot of people don't know who they are. Uh, they know their names. They don't know faces. But um, we wanted to take this opportunity to recognize them. And uh, they're going to be kind of surprised right now, but that's fine. That's what this is all about, surprises. Um, there's one gentleman sitting out here in the audience who came up here um, at a very important time in his family's life, seeing how there was going to be another Beast fan born very quickly. <laughs> I would like Mark Harmon to please come up here. As if anybody didn't know, and Kim are the founders of the Helpers Network. We have made a plaque up, it contains the Helpers Network logo. It says to Kim and Mark Hartman, founders of Helpers Network, special, special, special recognition for keeping the candles lit around the world for Beauty and the Beast. Presented at TunnelCon 1, Las Vegas, Nevada, July 21st, 1990. something she says <laughs> this is very much a surprise um, I've been made feel so welcome by all of you since arriving here on Friday uh, there's not a person out here who I don't wish I knew better and a person out here who I don't have the greatest respect and admiration for set because I wanted to know what was going on and um, the person responsible for me waiting at the mailbox is sitting out here with a camera on me right now, and she's going to have to put it down because I want Stephanie <laughs> Wilson to come up here. <laughs> I'm going to get killed now. Stephanie, as you all know, is the editor and founder of Pipeline. Pipeline has been a lifeline to a lot of us during dark times. And um, Stephanie has gone way out of her way, a lot of times at her own expense, at her own emotional problems. Not problems, but I just had to tell her. I shouldn't tell, I didn't write the speech. Maybe I should just read the plaque. <laughs> Quit while I'm ahead. I'm sorry. I knew she was going to kill me. Anyway, the plaque has Stephanie's Pipeline logo on it. It says to Stephanie Wilsey, founder and editor of Pipeline. Special recognition for going above and below in keeping the pipes tapping for Beauty and the Beast. Presented at Tunnel Con 1, Las Vegas, Nevada, July 21st. I thought you said I wasn't going to play. 
to make a new speech. <laughs> well, this isn't quite a surprise. Thank you very much. And I would like to say, in every issue, you see a number of different names of thank yous after them. And without these people, there wouldn't be any news to report. Um, I couldn't do it by myself. All of you have all helped. In fact, I think probably I've talked to at least one of each of you at least once on the phone, so <laughs> thank you very much. Look at all these people here. <laughs> um, you know, I never thought that back in 1976 when I moved up to Minneapolis and I began a rather peculiar habit of buzzing around the city lakes, going up to complete strangers, handing them a business card and asking them to come back to my studio and take their clothes off for me, <laughs> would lead to coming to all of this <laughs> and having this connection with a place called Hollywood and being part of a rather magical television show. I think a television show that, if I can misquote my own episode, ignored the boundaries, and colored outside the lines. And somehow I think all the people in this room are people who color outside the lines regularly. So many of you say the same thing that I say. This television show, this very strange television show, changed my life. It changed mine. I was used to hiding in my studio just doing my work. I never had any idea it would lead me this far and meet all these wonderful people who usually are only about this big in my life. <laughs> um, again, let me thank you too for being pillowed and laid in Las Vegas. <laughs> job on my episode, and I only wish George Martin was here because if it wasn't for George, the Bluebird never would have sung. And, um, never mind send us an audio tape greeting, which uh, if it has been properly queued up, we will now hear. In just a couple of hours, Kay and I will be leaving for London. And that for me is kind of unfortunate in a way. I'm going over there to do a television series, a mini-series for the BBC, and we won't be back till sometime in September at the earliest. And we've got so near to Tunnel Con, I was keeping my fingers crossed the whole time and hoping that somehow something wonderful would happen that would allow us to remain here and to be able to be with you tonight. So it is enormously sad for Kay and I to be leaving at this precise moment and not to be with you on this wonderful evening. But I hope that we are well represented by other members of the family and I would like to send my great love and affection to my beloved Ellen and to Jay, who I hope is there, and David, and to Rich Brinkley, which Brinkley has promised to be there, and that's great. He plays William the Cook, as you know. And I feel that's wonderful, because with Rich Brinkley there, you will hardly miss Kay and I at all, because I promise you he will eat at least twice as much as Kay and I would have ate together. He, um, he's a nice man, Rick. I, I adore him. I mean, I remember the first time he arrived on the set, the first day, and I said, I'm an extremely subtle person. I said, um, my God, you're vast. I said, how much do you weigh? And he, with tremendous modesty, said just uh, 380 pounds. So the first person I introduced him to, I said, this is Rich Brinkley. He's playing William the Cook, and he weighs 480 pounds. 
and they nodded politely and obviously agreed and didn't bat an eyelid so uh, it became a challenge from there on by the end of the day i'd got him up to 950 pounds and they were still believing me it's um it's difficult working with Rick simply because at the end of the day you can't, he can't get in the bath. It's impossible for him to get in the bath. You have to take him out in the backyard and hose him down. And I just hope that uh, he has a table all to himself, you know, because I mean there are people coming all the way from, from Germany. And with Rick on the same table, Rich on the same table, I mean the tremendous deprivation is going to go on there. But I do send him my fondest love. It was he that introduced me to my home up in the mountains, and we do see each other quite a lot, so I'm sure he'll take this ribbing from me. To all of you, I hope you're having a wonderful time, and I hope that the, the purpose, of course, of this tunnel con is to increase the friendships and to, so, to cement the friendships that have been formed over the past three years, and that we will be much stronger in our feeling of family for each other. Uh, and that's another reason why I'm particularly sad that your dear old dad is not with you tonight. Uh, but on the other hand, I hope that one of the purposes of this is to kind of do something about the disagreements that we've had with some of people who were our staunchest and firmest friends only a few months ago. There have been differences of opinion, uh, quite rightly so, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, over the third series. Uh, and um, I just hope that one of the results from this convention will be that we will extend the hand of friendship once again to those people and hope that we can win them over with love and affection to come back into the fold so that we do remain a united family throughout this kingdom and many other kingdoms around the world and that the dream will remain alive and grow stronger and stronger year after year and I hope this convention is only one. I hope to be <laughs> at the 20th convention of Tunnel Khan in Las Vegas. By then, perhaps my wife will allow me to spend a few hours at the roulette tables. I love you all. K sends her father's love and blessings. And uh, please, have a drink with me and to your very good health, all of you. God bless you. Right. Feels great to be back on Broadway. Name of the title? Yeah, very good, very good indeed. Took a circuitous route to Diane, get you. Diane, you have a phone call at the stage door. Diane, phone. <laughs> um, I just like to say hello and uh, thanks to all the the great fans. Uh, uh, the outpouring is probably greater now than ever, and uh, I get all your letters and. Um, I, I, I can't put into words how gratifying it is to, uh, to, you know, be made aware of the kind of impact that the show had. No, none of us expected for that to be the case, and um, um, certainly when one decides to go into acting, you know, that is a fantasy, you know, in the back of one's mind, and the fantasy has come true. and. Uh, Thank you for sharing that excitement with, uh, with me. And um, I'm in New York City now doing A Few Good Men on Broadway and uh, wish you were there. No, wish I was, no. You wish you were, no. Uh, I'm just happy. <laughs> I don't wish anything. But uh, I send my regards and uh, I hope everybody's having a great time and uh, don't hurt each other, so. We can leave it at that if you like. Yeah, why not? Pretty easy. <laughs> We're all woven together into a beautiful tapestry that's held together by one common thread. And I call this simply the dream. And so, from my heart to yours, barring any forgotten words, the first time I love forever. Oh.
of feelings. One voice inside is reminding me that it's better to have people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubts. Prayers <laughs> for all of you to sign that helped work on it and all of the stars and those of you associated with Beauty and the Beast. If you will sign it, once I can look a needle in the eye again. <laughs> how did Catherine say it? It's all so new. Sometimes I wonder how all those little pieces will ever fit together. <laughs> Thank Beauty and the Beast for not substituting slick talk for serious thought. We thank you for not equating valor with violence. We thank you for giving us the first character since Cyrano de Bergerac to perhaps suggest that your most important sexual equipment is located above rather than below your belt. <laughs> the journey of this quilt will continue, as will the fable. Stephanie Wiltsey will carry the quilt to Ron Coslo to present it to him, and he will receive it on behalf of all the, those that have worked on Beauty and the Beast. He asked me to tell you that he is very much here in spirit, and those of you that are doing the convention next year, I hope we can get body and spirit together. I don't know, because every time I pass it, I break into tears. You know? mm. They want to display this, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, great. And um, they had racks that were big enough to do this. Mm -hmm. So literally, this had to be totally stretched out and flat mm. to do the final assembly. Mm -hmm. It's staggering. It really is. is. Are we on camera? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is Patricia. Yeah, yeah. This is Patty Livingston. Where some of these that clothes yeah. came from. <laughs> it's phenomenal. So I, I, should, I can say a few words to Sally. No? Uh, Sally, I'm just completely overwhelmed by this. This is just uh, it's, it's something extraordinary. Uh, you know. Um, I don't think anybody who, um, I mean, in, you know, in television could ever hope for anything more from, from, uh, you know, uh, an audience, of viewers, and to reach people and, and have this come back. It's just, uh, it's just terrific. And I just want you to know how, um, you know, it's beyond words. I'm, I'm really speechless. I, I don't, I don't know what to say other than just thank you very, very much. It's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's really, um, for a writer, and this is a dream come true, you really, you, know, you really don't get these kinds of experiences very often. And I thank you for uh, allowing me to, uh, to have the experience of reaching so many people. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. It's really beautiful. I also have another presentation to make. This one you can keep. It's also made from pieces of the quilt. Um, beautiful. Beautiful. I will really treasure this. And the quilt I really, you know, want to send back to you as the custodian uh, to really care for it and and. Um, make it available to the right people in the right circumstances. This is really something that should be treasured. Uh, no is, one gets me to say, um, no. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Director and producer. producer. <laughs> what do we do, this way, right? Mm -hmm. Then this way or that way? Are you guys Boy Scouts? No. Scout. Yeah, I was both, but I forgot how to do the flags. <laughs> Should know that. <clears throat> That's looking good. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Gee, I should have looked at this while I was pulling it out. That might do it. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're making a shambles of your office. Yeah. There we go. That'll do it.
that whenever in my family, my father was a horticulturist, Bull Gear. I think you might not have seen him on the Waltons. Mm -hmm. And 1 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. And uh, this is the best of Papa, made by one of our local artists here in Topanga. And it's a, it's a place to be peaceful. It's a privet from where I think it is. Yes. From, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Shakespeare's. Yes, it's all. This is boxwood, which you'll find in Twelfth Night. Sing on things that we know, sort of like with the underground and being the beast. Mm -hmm. I think it's marvelous about that uh, story and uh, the beauty and the beast and being part of the underground world is that they have such caring values. And they care about the future generation of the young people. They, they don't isolate them or protect them, but they, it's almost like the underground was created to, to get people to rethink about life and its values. In a popular manner. Well, you see Vincent's whole love of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. his love of literature, he's passing it on to young people. And that's uh, by example, as you do here. Yeah, that's right. This is the, this is the theater. It was uh, during the winter. The floods can totally roar down here. <laughs> and we have to rebuild it, put it back together. But I think you're going to love this spot. Oh. We, have, oh. Hmm? Oh. we can swing from the rope if you want. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> mm, oh. This is gorgeous. Isn't this? beautiful. You see, the audiences come here, and it's a very rough and tumble, you know. They, they learn very quickly not to wear their fancy shoes and their white, you know, fancy clothes. They come here. It's almost like going to a football game. Petricum Botanicum. Oh, it's my it. underground. It's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. One of the bases for this video is the fact that we're we went down to the where the studio was. Do you want to sit for a minute? And they have a sign now, X Home of Beauty of the Beast. And they oh, and God, they said, oh, make you cry. I bet it is. We almost did. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reason we're doing this, too, is to prove that it still exists, even if it doesn't have any any s solid footing on Earth at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, there's still our imaginations and our love for it still continues. Well, you must realize also, as these different organizations have built up, you mustn't uh, ever become, like, lose faith, because, and, and continue to write. It's just like, you know, we have a responsibility as human beings in a country. We must never lose faith. We must continue to write our government and to tell them about the things that we want and believe in, and because it's the only way we're going to change things. Mm -hmm. And so you must continue to do that for what you want to see in your living room. It's a very rude place to be. Exactly. It's a very intimate place to be. And uh, you should have a right to have what you want in your own home. Mm. I was particularly happy, though, to, to see the, the reckoning and legacies finally put on the air. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine you're particularly proud of those episodes. Oh, yeah, that was nice. I didn't think they would. It was nice to see. It was a, char it was a character study that was, we all had questions about and wanted to know, and so it was fun to do. And I love working with Roy. You know, he's a, he's a wonderful performer and a dear heart of a man. Right. And the people in the cast were dear hearts. Again, I didn't work with the people up above. It was only down below, you know, so. It was nice. And I'm very happy she had such a lovely baby. Mm. Oh, Catherine. We'd been at that convention. Oh. It was... <laughs> I nearly got hugged flat. <laughs> <laughs> This area is where they kept the trucks that contained the lighting, costumes, dressing areas. They kept them in trucks so that they could go out on location with the same equipment that they would use inside. Behind me were the storage areas. 
and also some of the shops where they made various components of the set. But as far as I know, it was never used. It's even welded shut. You might recognize some of this area for some of the episodes that were used. This area was used for. This door was the main entrance onto the set. Oftentimes there were both of these wide open to let as much air in as possible. It was often very hot in there. Found this way. You had the various offices, production offices and accounting. There's not much left now. A frame from a matte painting. All that's left of Pascal's piping. Maybe even a sofa section from Catherine's couch. The sets are struck. The stage is bare. But still, something remains. And it remains with us. What do you call it? Imagination. If all you want to see is what you've seen before, half the time you're going to miss what's really going on. Not about says at all. Anybody want to write a set? Some of the episodes that we did. But, uh, 
I think that the show at some point needed to um, occupy a different space, a larger one, and return to the fantasy that um, was the promise of the show. Yeah. The show. So, it comes there, but um, I was just uh, called like within two days, the last two days, by uh, Artie Rip, who tells me that um, Capitol Records considered the first album a huge success. I considered the endeavor um, quite satisfying. Um, I was very proud of it. And so we're going to talk about doing a second one. And uh, if there is interest in, in uh, the company financing something like that, I am more than happy to do it. I always wanted to play Catherine. What was it like working with opposite women and Hamilton? was tough. <laughs> In terms of her being the beauty, it made my work a lot easier because she was. And um, she, she is. <laughs> and, uh, am I doing any more service? No. Did Vincent's wig ever catch on fire? No, that was Michael Jackson. <laughs> I think the my favorite episode was the, the finale of the first season. Um, a Happy Life, uh, which was written by Ron Coslow, and although the pilot, the first episode, was one of the most stunning scripts that I had ever read, um, A Happy Life was more indigenous and homogeneous. You know, I better not use big words because I'm proud of it. But uh, it was, it was uh, more pure. Beauty of the Beast, Vincent Catherine, and from doing Vincent or any other role, what do I draw upon from within myself? Well, instinct, mainly, on CBS to read for the part of Vincent. My decision was to not prepare at all because my instinctive reaction to who this guy was was so on the surface that I felt that if I prepared too much, I would have ruined it. That's it. <laughs> well, Colonel Jessup is, is, is one of the toughest parts I've ever played because he's so bad. <laughs> I was asked him to put together some videotapes of people like Colin Powell and Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf and those guys, and I saw what the military mindset operates like, and um, that was a part that I needed to do a tremendous amount of steeping myself into the kind of a mind that could do the things that he does. We can, uh, there's a number of things that I'm trying to develop myself with other people, and that's what I'm going to put my energies into doing. But uh, the episode chimes at, at midnight, uh, which, that's the one I directed. Yeah. <laughs> it was a long three years. Uh, and that was a long two years that week. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, uh, it would be something, somebody brought an incredible idea for a weekly series to me, and, and that's one of the things I'm going to go back out to LA to try to um, get going. If something great came along, I'd be more than happy to do another series. I'm not sure if I heard the entire question, but if, if, if we do a movie, will Linda Hamilton be in? Is that what you asked? Is the question. Because I'm not hearing you too well up here. Um, the movie uh, is yet to be even imagined. You know, I think what they do is they, they see whether there's an interest, whether they can get financing for it, and once all of those business decisions are solved, then they go to the inspirational phase. Exactly who will be in the movie and who won't be, uh, what it will be about, it's anybody's guess. And, uh, I mean, I don't know what I'd like to see happen, but you know, I'd love for them to find a way to uh, reunite. Uh, with the Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Any man looking as wonderful as so is Diane, and um, no one will tell you otherwise. Um, but it's difficult to take a show um, that is so fundamentally about something and make a sharp left turn um, like they did. And it's no one's fault. It's just the way circumstances happen to fall. Um, now, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of reading demographics and whether our ratings, in fact, actually began to erode when, um, when Catherine died. But uh, we, we were asking an awful lot of people who had invested a great deal of themselves in the story of these two lovers to perhaps go down a path that they weren't readily accepting of. And um, we were such a borderline show with regard to the way CBS viewed us all along that any move we made teetering in, in any direction would have caused our demise. Um, and I think basically that, that's what happened. Roy Beltrice is an incorrigible cutter. <laughs> and whenever he and I got together, the cost of an episode went way up. <laughs> the Two Beasts and a Bimbo was the subtitle of that episode. Uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, we did do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I confess. <laughs> I just put on little known fact, the original script for Bluebird ended with the sculpture of Vincent and Catherine being presented to them. George bumped it for the painting. I finally got my way.